Good morning and uh, welcome to the first masterclass this building has ever witnessed. Uh, and uh, we are so, so proud that Mary Jo Hatch is with us uh, to deliver us such an opportunity to have a discussion among uh, people who are passionate about organizational culture and studying organizations in general. Um, I, I'm not going to introduce you here because everybody here knows why they are here and who they are going to listen to. I'm just going to say that uh, uh, we have two hours all together. Uh, we may take a little break in between just to stretch our backs. Uh, then coffee and biscuits are uh, for your disposal here uh, during the break. We start the discussion with the master students interview. So these students are uh, having their exam today. <laughs> Part of uh, <laughs> Yeah, and since Maya is giving this exam, hello, uh, but she's not here to break it. <laughs> so it's our responsibility uh, to see that they are doing a good job. Uh, uh, and afterwards, uh, maybe 30 minutes or so, uh, when uh, you're done with your questions, uh, we can go around and uh, discuss uh, our questions. But maybe it would be a good idea to start with a short introduction, like uh, who is here, right? Who is who? Uh, so. Uh, so, um, yeah. I, I'm Krista. Uh, I'm. Uh, uh, I'm watching the time today. Uh, uh, I work in material management uh, and uh, yeah, studying uh, organizational culture uh, uh, during a long time ago, but now trying to do something uh, also. Um, uh, yeah. Smooth, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Aure Verk. I finished my PhD studies last year. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, my topic was about uh, connections between uh, personal, informal and formal knowledge processes, how these sites interact or disconnect. Okay. Uh, right now I'm active in the field of uh, human resources management and qualitative research in organizations that could help practitioners. Oh, excellent. Uh, my name is Veiko. I'm a PhD student at the uh, university and I, I am uh, very interested in uh, uh, different approaches of self-management, specifically holacracy and uh, yeah, radically distributed authority and how does that work? <laughs> okay. Hello, uh, my name is Lacey. Uh, I'm also a PhD student. Uh, so my interest is uh, library management and leadership and how library leaders decide. Okay. And I also work at the library, so I'm a student and a practitioner at the same time. Participant observation. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Pirat, and I'm also a PhD student. And my interest is intergenerational inclusion in the organization. And, um, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Hello, my name is Kathleen Bolk. I'm associate professor at the Estonian Business School, and I'm glad to meet you in person. Oh. We have been on the same project. I, I graduated from CBS. Oh, really? The Vikings. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> How did we never meet? No, we have met. Yeah, my research industry is, you know, following Thor's footsteps at the time and temporality. You know, okay. Oh well, I feel like I know you already. <laughs> <laughs> and you must be Quan. Quan Chan, I'm a PhD student, and uh, I, I contact you. Yes. You know, weeks ago. Yes. And uh, my topic about the uh, organization and culture in Asian context, mm -hmm. and I read a lot of. Paper, your paper, so <laughs> okay. See you face to face. My name is Anne, I'm the former PhD student here. Uh, actually, I was supervising Gara and currently doing some supervising uh, analysis topic. Um, I have studied organizational culture and I, I truly believe it's an important topic, but 
unfortunately nowadays uh, I'm doing a very little research because I'm the head of the faculty currently here. Oh, well, that'll do you. It takes a lot of time. <laughs> but I'm not doing it. So. Ah, glad you're here. Uh, my name is Victoria Hollandorm. I'm the master's student here at the University of Tartu and I'm studying financial management. And so I'm one of the lucky ones doing the exam today. So. <laughs> <laughs> And hello, I'm Heli Anni. I'm also the one of the lucky ones to do the exam and also studying, uh, doing my master's here in the University of Tartu, studying uh, marketing at the moment. Oh, excellent. In everyday life, I at the moment I work as a project manager in the theater of Vanamuina here. In Fun. And we also have one participant mm -hmm. in Zoom. Anna, could you say? Yes, hello. I'm the big brother in the room. Seeing everybody. <laughs> Um, I also have studied uh, organizational culture earlier uh, and I did my PhD thesis on this topic but uh, lately I have discovered other topics too but organizational culture is my first love so I'm very happy to be here and also participate from the farm. Thank you. <laughs> nice to Zoom meet you. <laughs> I'm just mentioning that we are uh, recording this session, but uh, we are only uh, concentrating on Mary here, so feel absolutely free. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we, we think that uh, there might be an opportunity, maybe to uh, to use these uh, some of these questions uh, in our future teaching on organizational culture. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. So uh, it will be. It's up to our master students how good they are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. <laughs> exam. <laughs> but then uh, I think the floor is yours to start. Thank you. So we are very privileged and honored to have this opportunity to interview you today. And uh, thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank, thank you for time. having me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought. I'd like to start with something that you have said before. Uh, you said that any narrative depends upon the perspective and location of its author. And your perspective is in a, as an American organization theorist, trained and employed in business schools, who has taught management and organization theory and published research on organizations in both the uh, US and Europe during the 1980s and 90s. Mm -hmm. But what I found interesting while uh, looking into <laughs> your, what have you done and, uh, and so on, and what I found uh, firstly very interesting was that you have very di diversity, diversity, <laughs> diversified, diversified yeah. uh, past, like in your ac academic uh, oh, yes. meaning. That's a nice way to put it. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it's, it's interesting to like understand like what, how people find their way, mm -hmm. their academic ways. Because you started with, with architecture, then went to English literature and creative writing, and then had your, uh, and then finance even. Mm -hmm. And then in your PhD, you finally got to organization <laughs> theory. And <laughs> How did you uh, find this topic now that you have dedicated yourself to? Well, um, a, a series of accidents. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that topic being culture, identity, image, corporate branding, etc. I mean, it's ev evolutionary. So I was studying at Stanford University for my PhD and looking for a dissertation topic and just sort of scrambling around trying to find something that fit. Well, Jeff Pfeffer, who had just published a book the year I arrived at Stanford, and the last two pages of his book talked about physical structure and how somebody needed to study this. Well, I had a background in architecture, so I ran to his office and said, pick me, pick me, I'll do this. He said, well, I don't know anything about it, but I'll introduce you to a few people who've built some corporate buildings around here, and you can go visit them and see what's going on. So we did that, and um, I went ahead and wrote on sort of the way in which people use space, because most architects sort of look at how people are making use of their space, what sort of work they're doing, et cetera, and, um, and then build models based on how can I facilitate the kinds of activities that these people are engaged in. 
So I wanted to look at something quantitative because I, the qualitative stuff scared me. So I said, what could I measure here? And I'm, I was serious about measurement. And what I could measure was the distances between things and how people use their space physically to move around and relate that to how they spent their time at work. So how does the physical space affect the way people interact and how they behave in their office environments. Well, at the time, there was a big movement toward open office spaces. So I decided to compare an organization that was dedicated to open offices and one that was dedicated to closed offices and see what that would bring. So I got some of the highest correlations anybody's ever seen at Stanford for social science. I had R squareds of 0 0.30. And Pfeffer looked at those and his eyes got this big and he said, you're done, write it up. Well, I started writing it up and when I started analyzing the data, what I discovered was Contrary to what people believed, which was open space environments encourage communication and transparency amongst those who are in those office spaces, and closed obviously does the opposite, it was completely the other way around. So people in closed office environments spend far more time working with other people and interacting than the people in the open office environments. Well. I wrote that up, got it accepted and graduated, hooray. And uh, the next thing I knew, one of the companies, the one with the open office spaces, asked me to come and present my research. Well, it turns out they had a consultant in who wanted them to move to closed office spaces. And the employees were fairly resistant to that idea. They had, their culture was sort of built around this open office space environment and how they interpreted that. So the, the, um, the consultant presented his case and then they brought me in as a kicker. Well, here I am, you know, just graduated doctoral student. What do I know from anything? So I present, you know, detailed analysis of what went on and tell them all about, you know, how no, it doesn't actually work that way. Uh, the management was delighted because they, they loved a good battle. Um, so the employees started talking to each other and to us and asking questions. And what emerged was, they still believed that they were communicating more in the open office spaces. And I'm going, what on earth is going on here? These are engineers. <laughs> and, you know, how on earth could they possibly misinterpret my data when I presented it in such incredible detail? Well, I had been studying culture with Joanne Martin at the same time, and what I realized was the symbolic properties of the spaces they were, were in overpowered the the sort of physicality of how space was actually affecting them. They liked the look of an open office space and the symbolic meaning it gave them about how communicative they were. And they could give a damn whether they really were or not. So that sort of kicked me back into culture, which I was trying to get away from because of you know, all that qualitative ooey gooey stuff. I'm like, you can't measure this if you want to save your life. Uh, so that's how I ended up studying culture and using a qualitative perspective because it was my observations in the space that allowed me to understand how they came to the conclusion that open spaces were affecting them in ways they absolutely were not. So from there it became, I mean, we did culture and I met Mike and Schultz and we worked together for, we worked together for 25 years in total. But we did a lot of work on culture and I published in that area. And then the culture sort of craze in the United States and in Europe more generally just sort of dried up. And Mike and I looked at each other and said, well, what can we do with this that's different from, you know, culture per se. So we attended a conference in Utah. <laughs> uh, Dave Wetton had organized this thing on organizational identity, which was his thing. And we got to this conference and everybody was defining identity in exactly the same terms we'd been defining culture, but nobody was talking about culture. So we said, oh, come on, you guys. You can't just you know, pretend you invented this stuff. So we began writing about the relationship between culture and, and organizational identity. 
So that's how we got to that piece. But then we realized that you can't stop there. There's you know, this interaction between those two things, but there's also sort of external images coming in. So when you go out into the field, you find that people are very concerned about how others are seeing them at the individual level, how stakeholders are viewing the organization at the organizational level. So we began to investigate those two things and realized that the processes underlying individual identity were identical to the processes that were at work with organizational identity. There's this Mead um, has this view of identity as a conversation between the I and the me, how others view me and how I interpret their in the sort of in the mirror, how do I look to others and then how do I know myself? And Mead claims there's a conversation going on between those two things and we said, well you kick that up to the to the organizational level and the conversation, the the we and the us, in other words, the we is the image that the organization projects and how it's interpreted and fed back to the organization. And the we is basically rooted in culture. So identity is a conversation between culture and image. And how does that actually play out in the world? So that's how we ended up where we were. And after that, the practical uh, application was corporate branding. So we moved from organization studies into marketing, <laughs> but with a very organizationally focused approach to branding that wasn't typical. It was mostly coming out of the marketing side at that point. So we had something new to offer there, and we thought, whoopee. <laughs> So during our course this semester, Organizational Theory and Culture, we had the opportunity to study several chapters from the book you have written, oh, called okay. Organization Theory, Modern, Symbolic and Postmodern Perspectives. So I'm going to follow up with, with some questions about that. Okay. Um, it was said that during a PhD there was a raging debate over whether qualitative or quantitative meth methods provided a better means of addressing the problems of organizing. Mm. How is it now, and what is your personal opinion on that topic? Well, I can't really tell you how it is now because I dropped out of academe about 10, 15 years ago. <laughs> so I have studiously avoided that as I am now a painter full time. And uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. But what I can say is that at the time that I started my PhD, it was more like a war rather than just a debate. Um, people who chose to do qualitative methodology were attacked like mad by people who were rooted in the quantitative uh, traditions. And my own view was that, you know, best of both worlds. If you can measure it like I did in my dissertation, um, you can find out some stuff that may leak over into what you want to study as a qualitative researcher. Uh, vice versa, when you're doing qualitative research, people who are come from a quantitative um, tradition can sometimes take the work that you've done and find things that they can measure and look at and test, you know, assumptions, etc. But that led me to understand kind of the very different philosophical perspectives that people come from. Um, and that there are, I mean, we got into paradigm wars after a while. And the reason I use the word perspective and not paradigm in my book, as I explain, is that paradigms tend to be more rigid. Perspectives I think you can cross between. You can hold multiple perspectives at the same time. And partly I learned that by moving from one culture to another. <laughs> <laughs> so you can live in both worlds. It's not easy. Uh, Mike and I wrote a paper very early on on uh, paradigm interplay, I think we called it. And so how do you, you know, do both and rather than either or? But I think that what's important to understand is that they do different things. So a quantitative tradition coming out of positivism and, and you know, an objective ontology really leads you in the direction of uh, explanation and control. So I think the motivation for people who want to, you know, lock it down with numbers and see what that, what kind of answers those produce really are trying to figure out how do I make stuff happen the way I want it to. In a qualitative tradition, which comes from, you know, subjectivist approach and an interpretive epistemology, 
um, you're really trying to understand get some deep appreciation for what's going on in the environment and you, you're not trying to control anybody but I think where you end up in practical terms as a manager is you you learn how to anticipate what's going to happen next so if you have a deep understanding of a phenomenon then you kind of can pick up or sense what's going to happen next and put yourself in a position to exploit opportunities or avoid you know negative outcomes um, and I personally have experienced it that way that if I spend enough time in an organization and really get to know the culture from the inside I can I can sort of tell where, what's going to happen in various situations as they unfold and I'm not always exactly right it always surprises me what what happens next but I usually am better at it than the people who don't have that sensitivity developed so I think those are really the, the key differences between the two. You're, you're doing really different things, and that's why mixing them is, is challenging. Because some people think, well, you do one qualitative study and one quantitative study, and maybe a postmodern study, and you triangulate on the truth. Uh -uh. <laughs> Doesn't work like that. So long answer to a short <laughs> question. <laughs> In the book, you also said that the contours of modernist, symbolic, and postmodern uh, perspectives constantly shift and change. Yeah. How are these perspectives affected by what's going on, in your opinion, in the world, yeah. uh, like COVID and the wars? I mean, do you think that these unforeseeable events uh, will have a permanent effect on uh, organizational culture? And if, if so, then in which way? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, <laughs> One thing I would like to do is shift that question in the other direction and say, how do the different perspectives look at what's happening with COVID and the war and all of this? So I think one of the reasons why I believe multiple perspectives are important is that you can glean different information or whatever you want to call it from each perspective. And if you do that internally, you can integrate those different perspectives into a fuller appreciation, understanding, and the p ability to explain what's going on. So for me, the modern perspective is about explanation, the interpretive perspective is about understanding, and the postmodern perspective is about appreciation. And we'd probably have to talk about that a little bit more, but <laughs> but that's why, for me, that's why I, I approach it the way that I do. And what was the rest of the question? It's like, if, if these will have like a permanent effect on, on, uh, on organization. Empirical on question. Oh. <laughs> As a person who likes to go out in the yeah. field and build my theory from the ground up, I, I have no idea. I mean, I have some observations having been on Zoom a bit. Um, I think the big question that needs to be answered right now is, are we going to keep doing this? Are we going to create a hybrid model? Or are we going to go back to the old way of doing work? And I think you can find examples of organizations doing any of those three things. It's true. Thank you. <laughs> so you said in your book that an organization can be viewed as a culture in its own right, mm -hmm. as a set of subcultures within the organization or a subculture operating within the national culture. And it's important to focus on all of these levels. So when talking about the cultural forces at the environmental, societal and organizational level, can you, maybe you have encountered during your research or maybe some specific examples that you can bring when one of these levels has been set aside? Or can you bring an example of a perfect organization in that sense where all of these levels have been covered? Yeah, I think, I mean, culture is not that um, conscious a thing for most people working in, we used to say culture is to humans as water is to a fish. <laughs> you know, you don't really process it at a level of consciousness like you would some other tasks in an organization. So I think that those levels of analysis, which is what you're referring to, of studying organizational culture are more about how do you place yourself as a researcher? So do you want to look at you know, the subcultural level, which is a very interesting thing to do. Uh, and they're always there. You can find them in, 
even pretty small organizations. So you can analyze that. And Joanne Martin and uh, Karen, what was her name? Yeah. My good friend Karen <laughs> did a, a study of DeLorean and looked at subcultural differences, which was quite interesting. You can look at it as an organizational culture as, as in a more holistic sense and get up to the organizational level of analysis and maybe make comparisons between different cultures and different organizations, which is where most of the quantitative studies have focused in culture studies. And then there's the larger issue of, you know, how does the outside of the organization interact with the within? And in a way, that's what Mike and I were looking at when we, we related culture to identity and image, because then you get sort of the inside out, outside in processes that bring the two together. Um, but there are other ways to go about it. Institutionalists do it at the, you know, macro level. But we were looking at the sort of micro processes by which that interrelationship happens. And I think in that context, it's hard to say which level of analysis we're operating at. It's, it's really all three, but not in the explicit way that, that, you know, methodologists would like you to do, which made it quite challenging to get uh, published. <laughs> Uh, you covered this topic a bit uh, earlier uh -huh. in our interview already, but uh, could you please explain a bit more about the role of the actual physical structure of ah. the organization in organizational uh, theory and culture? Yeah. Um, I mean, because I did my dissertation yeah. on that area, which is why I put it in the book. It was sort of very selfish of me, but <laughs> it, it turns out I was kind of ahead of my time because now everybody's interested in this topic 30 years later. <laughs> yeah, better late than never. Um, for me, and this relates somewhat to the work that Mike and Tor are doing. Um, there's not necessarily a temporal dimension. It's kind of atemporal in the sense that the past gets embedded in physical artifacts that are then a part of the life of the organization. And they may be interpreted in ways that have nothing to do with the history of the organization, or they might lead you back into the history of the organization. But every time you create some physical property of that organization, whether it's the building, the structure itself, or just a simple artifact like a product or a coffee mug or something, that stuff hangs around. And there are possibilities for people to recover meaning in the past that may or may not relate to what the people who produced that artifact or that physical structure had in mind when they did so. But there's this continuity that physicality produces. So that because it's there and you can't deny its existence, it gives you a chance to ask questions and to learn and discover in new ways. So at Carlsberg Breweries in Denmark and around the world as it ended up, we began to look at how one particular artifact, which was actually a slogan, Semper Ardens, came about. We, en we ended up seeing it at the end of a very long process that went all the way back to the founder. And at various stages, this thing would be forgotten, and then somebody would rediscover it, go back and look where it came from, and then add their meaning to it. And then it would die again. And you know, 20, 10, 20 years later, it pops up another time. And the same thing happens. People look back, and then they see the last time it happened, and they say, oh, well, there's even more. And the whole history of the organization starts to bloom in front of them. And then they're able to use that meaning to do something new that needs to be done today that would, you know, the founder never would have thought about. But yet, there he is present in that, you know, further so you wonder you know what happens another hundred years from now <laughs> and it's not just one artifact I mean if you think about everything physical about an organization I mean the possibilities just are mind-boggling and we live in these spaces and these with these properties and sometimes we're not aware at all what they're doing to us and yet there they are <laughs> Earlier you talked about um, perspectives and paradigms and uh, the difference between those. Mm -hmm. When you think about the book you wrote, 
you have anything that, until this day, you think should have been covered, should have been added to the book, or do you have any changes regarding the perspectives you wrote in that book? Yeah. The things that I'm terrible at are economics and critical, radical, critical radicalism. Um, I just don't get the critical perspective very well. I mean, I read Marx and I did all that kind of stuff, and once once it got into sort of the modern interpretations of critical theory, I just couldn't get my head around it. Now, partly that's because I'm an American, and we're not very good at that stuff. Um, there are some who are, but not me. Stan Dietz, if you want to read somebody who's American who gets it, uh, he is constantly yelling at me. <laughs> and the economic stuff, I mean, I, I studied it. I kind of understand it. I, I'm better at the financial stuff than I am the truly economic aspects. So those, those are the weaknesses in the book, and anybody will tell you that. As for what is missing, in the fourth edition, the things you pointed out, uh, hermeneutics, et cetera, um, those things are a little better developed in the, in the 2018 edition, um, which is quite a shift from the, the 2013. Um, but the thing that I really would like, it, it, the thing that I think is, is showing up at least in my Swedish context, I was working there for a while, um, is American pragmatism. And the reason I find this interesting is I think that it cycles back and, and sort of repositions the modernist tradition. So it's, it's very rooted in empirical experience. You know, the idea John Dewey, I particularly like in the pragmatist tradition, his idea was that he was an educator. You teach children best by putting them into situations and allowing them to learn for themselves. And I think that his notions, and he also wrote a wonderful book on art as experience in which he said, nothing can be fully useful that is not also beautiful. And being an artist, I really like that. <laughs> so there's, and, and that was pragmatism to his mind. So if you make something beautiful, you also make it more um, approachable, more useful in terms of human development. And I think that there's a link between sort of the hardcore modernist ideas about how you approach anything in life that Dewey speaks to and then adds to. So I think we could recover some of what's been sort of overlooked about the modernist tradition um, from some of these other perspectives and maybe get to a better integration. And that suggests to me, if we're coming back around to that, are we going to come back around to interpretivism? Or are we going to come back around to postmodernism or whatever that turns into? So that's the thing that, I, that fascinates me most. I also love hermeneutics. I just think it's a cool idea. The arc, the trace, and the horizon of expectations, just it's lovely. <laughs> Gadamer. <laughs> So now moving on to the article talked about earlier, uh -huh. uh, relations between organization, culture, uh, identity, and image. Uh, there you talk about the Dutton and Dukrich's study on the mm -hmm. Port Authority, where they only took action on the homelessness problem as a result of negative organizational image received. So that made me th uh, think, like, uh, or how and when should actually social problems be handled by organizations in terms of organization and culture? Always. Always. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> like, when they appear. Well, the thing is, you can't not do that, can you? I mean, it's, it's culture is sort of where you're coming from, so it's impossible not to. I think what you're asking is, can you do it consciously? Yeah. And that's trickier. That I'm not even sure is a good idea. <laughs> I think that, you know, culture does its thing, and if we understand how it works, then we don't have to try to be so manipulative. We can say, well, what would this, I mean, one of the things I love about branding is it gives you a real concise answer. I'm facing a problem. What would my brand do? What's, what's the way in which 
Coca-Cola approaches problems? What's the way in which Lego approaches problems? And that gives you the sort of historical sense, which we saw in some pretty interesting organizations actually taking place. The work that Tor and Mikan has done on Lego and that she and I started even earlier is an excellent example of that. They just, you know, they, they had a problem with one of their uh, toys, I think it was called Mindstorms, where people were hacking into the robotic platform that, um, that was being used. It was, I don't know if it was Mindstorms or the thing that came after that, but uh, they had created a, a platform that was available online where kids could come and design a robot and it would give you little programs to make it do stuff. Well, people started hacking into the program and making it do other stuff. And, uh, and they were you know, ready to get out the lawyers and go after these guys because mostly they were adult uh, users of Lego. And, uh, and Jorn V. Knudstorp, I think, was CEO at that time. It may have been the guy before him, but I think it was Jorn V. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. What would Lego do? You know, how does Lego approach problems like this? And instead of getting out the lawyers, they published a license to hack on their website, <laughs> which was like really the right thing to do. And uh, their, their product line wasn't doing very well, and all of a sudden it did a whole lot better because people thought, this is really hot. These guys get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think, you know, you can sort of semi-consciously say, what, what is the soul of this organization and how does it approach problems? Or in the ideal world, how would we deal with this? Because often you're doing something that you haven't done before. And I think that that's a real healthy response. That's true. <laughs> I think time-wise we can slip in one last question. Um, let's talk about a bit more about identity. Okay. Um, it involves who we define and experience ourselves, but it's also important how others in interpret who we are and what we're doing. Do you see that this kind of change that takes place in the employees naturally, in their behavior, in their well-being, who they are, could be at any point toxic or negative yeah. to the organization and bring it further apart from the clients. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this we talk about in our uh, dynamics of organizational identity paper in human relations some years later. But we identified two really um, negative ways in which you can undermine a healthy identity conversation. That is the conversation between culture and image or inside, outside, however you want to think about it. And one of them we called hyperadaptation, and that's where you pay more attention to the right side of that little model, which is you know how others see us and how we interpret, how we take that in. Um, if you forget your culture and just say, we'll do whatever they tell us to do, then you end up adapting to everything that comes along. And Lego is an excellent example of this. They, for a time, anybody who had any idea about what they wanted to do got to try it out. So they were making children's clothing. They were doing bricks in pastel colors. They were opening, they were creating a TV show for children on Saturday morning. That's the one that got them because it's just a money sink. <laughs> so they got themselves in a whole lot of trouble. Simultaneously, they got trapped on the other side. So they were looking at, you know, two Toy of the Century awards and going, aren't we the hottest thing that ever walked the earth? And uh, they started listening to their own PR. And instead of, you know, seeing how other people were examining the world and how their, their toys were actually being consumed and how kids were playing with them, uh, they started saying, well, we're, you know, we're the Toy of the Century, so how can anything go wrong? And they really disconnected from what was going on on the outside. And the big problem was that at that point, mostly it was parents buying Lego for their kids because they thought it was cool. They played with it when they were kids, and oh boy, my kids will love it too, and they didn't. <laughs> so, you know, houses were filling up with Lego bricks, and kids were not playing with them. Uh, so there was a big disconnect. So you can get toxic toxicity in, in either way when you break that conversation and you don't have the inside talking to the outside. Huge role for top management. Listen, then respond. 
<laughs> Thank you for the answers. It was really, really eye-opening, and I think uh, each one of us can, can take uh, something uh, with us from this interview. Well, thank, thank you, you for your questions. Excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you. I think we can safely say you, uh, that uh, Mary Jo passed the exam now. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, but, okay, thank you so much. It was, uh, it was really interesting. Uh, time flies like... Uh, <laughs> It does. But now it's uh, time for us uh, uh, to uh, <laughs> have our questions. <laughs> I want to use my position here and uh, ask you, okay, we came to this wonderful Delta building mm -hmm. and you have this thing in architecture. How, how do you see our culture as a first time? First you time my question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I can't say much about your culture because this is my first interaction with anybody that belongs here except for dinner last night. Um, but the space is, I mean, architecturally speaking, the space is fabulous because it has so many possible uses. I mean, whoever designed this building has said, how can we make spaces that can be used in multiple ways? And that's, that's really, I think, a key to design for this generation that you have to be able to go places because they're nice and you know you have nice views and you have a good environment um, that can facilitate imagination and creativity and all the things you hope your students will use um, so I like it in that sense but I have no idea whether it fits your culture or not it's very modern are you modern <laughs> <laughs> We are aiming to do the shift. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I think that's are, the image part now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Tartu University is really old. Yes. Yeah. But we, we don't want to be, you know, stuck in our history. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, d I don't see any sort of connection to the past here. Uh, there yeah. is actually yeah. we have a small computer museum even on the first floor. Oh really? Maybe the faces that you yes. commented. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Past professors and past yes. professors. This is like a past thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, please. Who's going first? Who's going? I have a script here if you want me to point it. I I can and I can start. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you know my topic. Yes. Um, so, so I was wondering, you know, just to look from your perspective, how do organizations evolve and would self-management be in the picture for you? I sure hope so. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm a very independent-minded person, and so for me, any structural constraint is uncomfortable. And I don't know to what extent, I mean, I, I do know that there are, are a host of people who like structure a lot and who want to be told what to do and they're very uncomfortable when they have to figure things out for themselves. Um, I've been told that Estonian culture likes a lot of rules and structure. I don't know if that's true or not because I've only been here three days. <laughs> um, but I'm mindful that in America, for instance, there are a lot of people who just want to go to work, do what they're told, come home, and then their life begins. So there's a split between that and what's going on in the more high-tech sort of areas of work, which I think work is very rapidly drifting into. I don't know what the people who need a lot of structure are going to do in the future. I guess they're going to work for the bureaucracy um, because it will remain. There's no getting rid of it as far as I can see. But I think that, that entrepreneurial activity is becoming more and more common in the workforce that I've seen, and I've heard that you guys, if you, if you don't have a startup, you're not really an Estonian. <laughs> so in that sense, I mean, that what gets more self-management than that is everybody's out doing their own thing. And um, for me, the interesting thing organizationally is, does that mean that, that corporations disappear? Um, or do they maintain their bureaucratic function and structure and then we just dip in and out of them with our little projects and things that we can do? 
And most entrepreneurs at this point in time, their vision is, I'm going to build something and sell it. And who are you going to sell it to? Well, one of these big conglomerate, messy things that uh, have lots and lots of structure. So it's kind of a both-and thing. And I think the self-management part is what I do on my own or with a small group of people that have similar interests to mine. And then how do we interact with those big, hideous things <laughs> that <laughs> try to constrain us? Uh, and one way is sell it off, and I don't have to deal with you at all. Uh, there are very few people who can move from entrepreneurship into a big, the leader of a big, ma uh, massive corporation. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, a few of those guys have managed to pull it off. But most of the people I've met in the IT world don't really want that. They, they think it's a lot more fun to build something from scratch, and so they keep recycling that over and over again. So I think, you know, for some part of the world, that self-management piece is huge. I think a lot of large organizations wish they would have more self-managing employees. I don't know if they're going to get that, because the people who are good at self-management don't really want to be part of that. And I think a lot of leaders lie when they say they want self-managing teams, because as soon as somebody does some self-management, they fire them. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen plenty of that. <laughs> So I don't know if that's helpful or not. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, no, just encouraging, I would say. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I want to pick up the last question that the girls had. Um, so you talked about the Lego and, and, and the outside looking at the Lego in a different way. And um, so how do you change the view of the outside of the organization? If an organization has done something, there's an image, there's a way the outside world sees this organization, what are the goals and roles of this organization should be and, and have always been. So how do you, and if you want to do something different, so what are the ways to change how the outside views the organization? Well, I mean, marketing, <laughs> for instance, <laughs> PR, branding. Um, the trick is, how do you keep the connection between who you really are and what you're trying to persuade other people that you are? So the first question is, do they see what we really are and we don't like it? Uh, is that why we want to change? Which the answer then becomes you have to do something different inside before the outside view is going to going to evolve into what you want. Uh, the other question is, if you are in fact misperceived by the outside world, why is that? Have you done something wrong in your communication, or are they stuck in a past image of who, you know, Singer, oh, that's sewing machines. Well, it hadn't been sewing machines for 70 years. <laughs> um, so how do we get people to see us in the way that we truly are? And I think those are two really, really different problems. So the answer would be, in the one case, change what's going on internally and then communicate that to the outside world and constantly assess whether they're seeing any change and registering what's going on. If not, you have to do something different in the way that you're communicating. But you know, if in fact they just don't get you because you've evolved way beyond where they think you are, and that happens a lot, I mean, the image gets stuck. Um, then you've got to work really, really hard. And I think one of the most interesting ways to do that is to send your employees out as ambassadors all over the place and talk about what the organization is doing that excites them. But they better be excited before you send them out there. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, one of the problems is we, we tend to bring in outside consultants and say, you know, fix this, would you please? And pff, never works. Lots of money is made, though. <laughs> if, I, if I may ask, uh, because it is interesting, the outside, but if something happens inside, I mean, if there is a new management, for uh -huh. example, and then this uh, inside start to rotten, in a way, is there anything to do in this case? So you mean? I mean that if there is a change in the organization, uh -huh. and then the organization inside start to uh, people are not so happy, or yeah. there's no clarity, or there's uh, some other things happens, 
is there anything that the organization can do? Oh yeah, get a new management. <laughs> <laughs> management very often the same person. So uh, in this case? Yeah, then you go get another job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, good. Yeah, no, we actually saw that happen at, uh, at Carlsberg. A guy came in who was really financially oriented, I mean outcome oriented, and the old management had all been part of the brewery, the old brewery culture in Carlsberg. When the new management came in and tried to modernize, they brought in people from Coca-Cola, from Pepsi, from I don't know what else, um, oh, Gillette. Uh, they all had these sort of modern management techniques, but they didn't have any appreciation for brewing to speak of. I mean, they even started calling beer liquid. <laughs> and people were just appalled. Now they did do some things that were really needed to make the organization more efficient and more effective in a thousand different ways. They brought in a supply chain management um, system that really worked well. But they also fired most of their master brewers who were the keepers of the culture, the guys who knew the stories, who had the real feel and, and sense of, of it. And the first few years that we were studying Carlsberg, I didn't notice it, but we went to see a master brewer who ran the microbrewery that's in their like corporate museum, basically. And first of all, we couldn't even get to him. He didn't want to see us, and they had us come meet him at a time when the area wasn't open, so we had to be really clever to get into him. We finally got somebody to take us up to his office, and he took us up in a grain elevator. And I'm going, this is the first time I smelled beer the whole time I've been studying this company. <laughs> so there was this real disconnect between top management and the way that they were trying to lead the organization and what everybody else thought Carlsberg was about. Uh, he ultimately got fired. Um, he did some really good things for them that needed doing, but they brought somebody in from the dairy industry who's now running the company, and he's gone back to, you know, appreciating what the culture is truly about and the identity that people have with the company. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you can replace top management, but you need a board that can see what's going on. Um, a lot of people left Carlsberg. A lot of people. Most of the brewers. So I don't know what will happen in the future, but, uh, but at least they're respecting the culture now. It's a very interesting case. But still there are situations where you need to change culture, culture but then I mean, the message is that you should respect all the old culture and try to Yeah, you, I think you can move culture. Yeah. Um, but changing it, as far as I can tell, there's two ways to do it. Wait 25 years with new emphasis for that 25 years. Or you can replace half of There is something, some sort of crucial, crucial functions in the organization that only uh, this sort of uh, living uh, informal collectivity can perform. And it uh, lives its own life and you should not sort of stay out of it or, or disregard it. But, uh, but uh, yeah, not, uh, not the question to have a simple answer to. Who put you in this position? <laughs> <laughs> this is not really a named in-house ethnographer. Uh, okay. A human resources consultant for a particular ah. department, large department in our organization. Uh, my job is to help understand the problems and uh, help solving those problems. But uh, I, uh, because of my background in the qualitative research, I tend to fill this role in a way that I find it most interesting and useful. So. Yeah. Um, when I found myself in similar situations, and not exactly like what you're describing, but as a researcher sort of plunked down in, in with expectations that I was going to come up with something that would be helpful, um, what I tended to do was use all my knowledge to figure out one leverage point. So something that, w if it changed, would make a big difference. And then try and find the people around me who could make that happen. 
So it's really like the opposite of what you think it would be. I would take my organization theory book if I couldn't remember all of it, and I'd read through and say, what is it in their conversations that they're ignoring? It might be physical structure. It might be something to do with technology. It might be something to do with culture. There was always something that they, in their conversations, they would cover a lot of the territory that organization theory covers. Um, and then there would be something that they just weren't paying any attention to. And I'd say, hey, did you ever think about this? And then just sit back. I mean, you can just lob an idea in, and if there's truly a, a gap, they'll, they'll pick up on it. They'll say, wow, never thought of that. Aren't you clever? And, uh, and they'll run with it in their own way. And I wouldn't know what they were going to do with it. So it wasn't like I was saying, OK, I'm going to fix this organization. It was just, you're missing a piece. And if you put that piece in the way you're thinking about your problem, will shift. And usually, some shift in a stuck problem in a group will cause something new to start taking place. And it, it loosens things up and allows something new to happen. And that's sort of the best way in which I worked within companies. Um, Mike and I would find, especially in Carlsberg, that they wanted to use us as much as we wanted to study them. Um, you know, they figured we were a channel to top management, and they'd tell us all kinds of stuff they wanted top management to know. <laughs> and you may find that you get a lot of that, too. And finding a good way to channel that information up to top management can be very, very useful. Because most top managers are terrible at listening. They just don't hear. But if they get a weirdo like a researcher in their midst and he comes and says, I found this really curious thing, uh, you know, don't say these guys want you to know. But you know, I observed this stuff going on, and I thought you should know about it. Again, you won't know what they're going to do with that, but it can be an extremely useful way to sort of introduce a, an element of change. Uh, the final way that we did it was um, at, at Carlsberg, almost everybody at CBS at some point, all the faculty at some point or another studied Carlsberg. So um, we ended up putting a one-day seminar together for the board of directors and any top managers who wanted to come, in which we invited kind of the people who'd done what we consider the best research on Carlsberg. There were about eight different research projects. And during that day, we each presented our research, Mike and I included. And again, we had no idea what they were going to do with this information, but man, did they love it. It was like, you know, we get to hear about ourselves and from all these different perspectives with all these different interests. And that was an extremely effective way to kind of make a contribution. And again, I mean, as an ethnographer, you don't know what people are going to do with your stuff. You just don't. <laughs> you can kind of guess, but I'm, all, I'm almost always wrong. And you often don't get to find out. You know, you throw it in there, and who knows what they did with it. At, at Unisys, when we presented our humor paper to the managers, at the end, the one takeaway was that one of the guys says, did you guys ever see the movie Gorillas in the Mist? Mist? About um, one of Levy's students, I can't remember, Diane Fossey. No, Diane Fossey? Anyway, she went and lived with gor gorillas in Africa, and uh, they made a movie about her life because in the end she was killed, and nobody really knows why she was murdered, but they buried her next to her favorite gorilla. And it was a strange documentary-inspired kind of tale. Um, the woman from Aliens, Sigourney Weaver, played Diane Fossey. Um, Anyway, so we get done presenting all this stuff about the humor in their team and what we make of it. <laughs> the one manager goes, ah, manager's in the mist. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the only feedback we really got. <laughs> so you often don't know. But I think it's, it's fun to sort of put things in the system and see what happens. If you're there full time, you can actually see what happens. Well, I see those loops completing kind of at times I hear from let's say, our higher managers that their subordinate managers sort of use the language that um, 
sometimes I've used when writing up those yep. findings that this start circulating certain ideas, certain perspectives. So it's going rather well. I I, I would say that I'm <laughs> not not so much in the dark and quite often also involved later when. No, okay, that that's that's good that you you can be there. What can we actually do about certain mm. things? And that allows you to learn to to sort of work the system so that it's more effective for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just as an aside, um, Gideon Kunda worked in one of the high-tech firms in the United States. Well, like, he studied them for his dissertation. And uh, he's a, I think he was trained in anthropology, but he was really involved in sociology and anthropology and all this stuff. And he watched these guys and made this, wrote a brilliant book about the IT company that he was studying. And anyhow, he presented his, he, toward the end of the uh, engagement with the company, he started hearing from the various people that were his informants. They started quoting Goffman to him. <laughs> 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 it was like I've mucked up my my entire site. <laughs> so yeah, there's that. <laughs> yeah. When Rick asked about the self-management teams and organizations, and uh, in your response, I, I kind of understood your skeptical view. Uh, but Krista has studied uh, values-based management. Ah. What about that? Can that be the like the, the, the promising uh, way how to manage uh, the organizations? I mean, that's what that's what practitioners wanted from culture studies. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know basically how to control their organization through its values, yeah. and um, I think values-based management, as long as it's it's open-ended, is great. Um, but if what you mean by values-based management, that you write down the values and put it on a little card and everybody puts it in their wallet and sits on it all day, I mean, that's, <laughs> we saw an awful lot of that go on. Um, but I think there's more sophisticated values-based management that's happening. I find it easier to talk to people in companies about, cult, uh, about branding. So is, is my behavior and what we're doing as a company brand consistent? Mm -hmm. Is this what the brand would do? And some companies even create a brand that's a, that's a person so that you can talk about how that person would react in this situation. That helps people imagine how to invoke the values. Um, Johnson & Johnson is excellent at value-based management, or they are from time to time. So um, for periods when their, their uh, credo is really operating as it should, People reflect on their on their own about whether this is is consistent with the credo. What happens is that you get periods when top management sort of leads you in the direction of let's make more money and forget about everything else. Um, the whole credo system starts to break down, and if management recognizes that that's happening, they have a, a habit now because one of their the founder's son, I think, was the first to do this. Um, basically saw this happening and he went out to the entire company and said, look, we're not practicing the credo anymore. And this was my father or my grandfather, I can't remember which it was. Um, this was his gift to us. And if we're not going to use this, then let's get rid of it. Okay, we're going to vote. And you, you know, almost unanimously, they all go, okay, we're keeping it, we're keeping it, we're not going to let this go. And any of the new people who don't get it get an education in why the credo is valuable and why we ought to use it in our daily life. So I think, I think it's possible to do this, but it's, you know, it takes a pretty sophisticated organization to keep it going for a long period of time. Uh, Johnson & Johnson was really good at it. I, lately, they've gotten themselves into some deep water. I don't know what's, what's happened because I haven't kept up with them. But, but I saw it happen once where they went through this process, and it was pretty powerful. I thought it was amazing. I tried to help a couple of other organizations create this. It's not easy. You have to have real buy-in from your top management team and usually the next level down, too. Um, it takes a lot of work. 
I would uh, give an opportunity for our Zoom participants to maybe turn their microphones on and uh, ask a question if they have one. Hello out there. <laughs> we have Anna and Maya. Maya is joining from the bus, I understand. From the bus? <laughs> yeah, from Tallinn to Tartu. Uh, no, Maya, we cannot hear you. This is so noisy. Okay. Thank you so much, Mericho. And it was interesting to follow what you have said. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, now we could hear you very well. <laughs> uh, Anna, maybe, do you have a question? Yes, I actually have. So uh, in the beginning of this uh, masterclass, you were talking about open plan offices and closed offices. But uh, what do you think about uh, activity-based offices? What is Are that? Are they good for culture and stuff? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> ah, so this is the middle ground. So the office that has closed areas for concentration and privacy and the, all these open areas for teamwork and, and so on. So mix of open and closed. Well, I haven't studied them, so I don't really know, but I would think it would be ideal. Um, the issue is, you know, whether you want people having um, open communication, which tends to be easier in closed spaces because people feel more comfortable. Um, you know, it's, it's easier to express how you're really feeling in an area where nobody can overhear you. Uh, you get a lot of superfluous conversations in those situations too, so they tend to be a little less efficient. But the real question is, when people have these hybrid spaces, are they using them effectively? So do they go to the closed space when they need to have a private conversation? Do they go to the open space when they need to be overheard by others? Um, or do they do the opposite? <laughs> mm, yes, the studies show that they don't move. Yeah. They take one place and stay there, and uh, rarely anyone uh, loses the space as it should. Yeah, I, I so think moving around the different suitable places. Yeah, that's the problem. There was there were studies done long, long time ago, uh, before I even did my dissertation, that show that people don't usually go outside of a 15 foot circumference of where they're sitting very often. You put them on different floors and forget it, they'll never see each other. Stairways are really problematic. <laughs> so maybe that still holds. You can teach people how to use space better, but, um, but whether they will, it's up to them. Yes, and the fun problem with these activity-based offices is that, that nobody knows where anybody is. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a real, real problem. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, maybe we can uh, talk about it tomorrow as well uh, in our panel at the conference. Uh, but uh, yeah, but the big trend now after the corona is uh, to reduce space, yeah. right? And to have this hot desking and you know, all these efficient ways of uh, organizing nowadays. Yeah, they had hot desking quite some time ago. Um, didn't work out very well. Okay. Uh, you still think it won't work? I mean, again, it, Humans are very adaptable, so if you stick them in a situation where they have to adapt, they will. But if you put them in a situation where their opportunity is to stay the same, they will do that too, especially you know, in terms of movement around. Um, we tend to be kind of lazy physically. Uh, but I think there are things that you can do to create spaces where people interact in casual ways that are very useful to an organization. And many of these comp IT companies in the US have campuses where they have fitness facilities and places with chefs that fix them all kinds of fancy food that they actually want to use. And so they end up interacting with one another in ways that you know wouldn't be determined by where their cubicle is or where they decide their hot desk is. But again, with hot desking, it's a question of, you know, where, where is she? <laughs> Can't find her. <laughs> Which can be a good thing. But <laughs> we have tried this, that, that in order to make people move and communicate more between the floors and different departments, is uh, I had on Fridays, uh, people were not allowed to call and uh, email to each other. 
if they wanted to talk, they had actually had wow. to talk to that person. Yeah. If they wanted to. Well, the Estonians were very rule obedient. That's how it works. So there was that like, like peer pressure saying, okay, you can't email me, I'm not going to reply your yeah. email. It's Friday and you're not supposed to email me. And so what happens if I do still? You know, well, that's what I'm saying, that's the peer pressure. Well, nothing uh, happens, nobody gets, you know, punished for that. <laughs> like, you know, they have to themselves, you know, force this thing. That, you know, oh. yeah. So, but was it sustainable practice? Did it stick? Well, it sticked until I was forced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, exactly. Until I was in a position to force it, let's put it that way. Oh. Mm -hmm. But what was uh, the right reason? Well, the reason was that uh, because uh, one of the issues that we have in our organizations is we have departments. So people communicate yeah. among people in their own departments. You get silos. The other person on the other side of the building. So we try to have these big coffee rooms that everybody has to go there and they still eat at their desks or find their ways. So that was one of the ways that I tried to get people to move actually, yeah. to go to another person instead of just, you know. And sure. what they did was like, I, they postponed their emails to Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a way around it. Like, oh, Friday, I write on Monday instead of Saturday. I don't want to move. <laughs> a work alone day. <laughs> <laughs> there were people who actually really love that one, so, so I think it's just. We should fun. try it. People are staying in home offices, so <laughs> they need to take a bus to go to somebody's <laughs> home to talk. But Quan had a question, yeah? Yeah, I, I have a question about the academic job uh, in the US right now. So, uh, in your opinion, how many. Uh, graduate PhD student from US can get a job in academia and uh, do you have any advice for the graduate PhD student? Who graduate How to get a job? Yeah, I really don't know what's going on because I haven't been involved for 15 years. Um, I would assume we, we're having a huge decline in enrollments at the undergraduate level. It hasn't hit the graduate level yet, but it will. Um, there has been quite a decline in the people who are willing to get PhDs, so there should be jobs available. The problem that we have in the U.S. is that most schools are now taking advantage of people and giving them part-time work or unpaid work, uh, which is even worse. And there's quite a scandal about some universities not paying their faculty. But people are so desperate for jobs that they'll take this opportunity. So there's, there's becoming kind of a class system where you have people who are on truly academic track positions, which are becoming fewer and fewer. And then this huge pool of people who are willing to teach on pretty much any terms in the hope that someday they can get into that other category. So uh, with declining enrollments, I'm not sure what's going to happen in the next few years. I'm, I'm pretty sure the schools are going to get kind of scared about things. I mean, the, what it costs for an education in the U.S. now is just ridiculous. People can't afford it. They go into debt they can't get out of. And, and young people now are looking at that and saying, I think I'd rather get a technical job or a certificate where I can get you know, paid probably almost as well as somebody with a college degree and not have all this debt to live under for the rest of my life. Um, so wealthy people are still going to school, but some of the people who don't have that, that um, wealth in their family are choosing other ways to, to educate themselves. And I mean, you can, if, if all you really want to do is have knowledge, you can get that off the web pretty easily. You don't need to go to college for that. So I think we're going to see a real shift in the way education works, at least in the U.S. in the next five or ten years. Um, I mean, public funding of schools has diminished almost nothing. So all the state schools used to be dependent on taxes. They, they're not getting funds from, from their tax base at all anymore. So that's, you know, the amount it costs the student to go to school has just skyrocketed to make up the difference. And that's why faculty are under so much pressure to publish. Well, what they're really under pressure to is, is get grants because the university can then take 50 to 80 percent of that money and use it um, to function. Uh, and then in, in place of faculty, now you get almost as many fundraisers as you have faculty. So the whole model has just turned 
upside down. It's just nuts. And the students look at this and say, why on earth would I pay you all this money when you didn't even care about me? <laughs> so it's, it's, we're in crisis in education in the U.S. And I, I think it's a little better in Europe still, but... It, it, Not it, much. No? Yeah, it's pretty sad. I worked in South America some, and they're really, it's a terrible situation. People who have PhDs and want to teach and educate have to take one, two, or three extra jobs just to be able to survive while they're also teaching. It's, it's just crazy. It's like we've lost our respect for education.